We're a growing church, and I'm always thinking and asking God, how do we best staff our church to serve our body? And I got some cool updates. We're having our staff do some realignments. We're bringing on new staff. So I just want to quickly update you all. Some of you might have heard about these changes at the family meeting, but I know all of you weren't there. So as a church, I just want to update you as a family as to where our staff is aligned now. We can celebrate that and pray for that together. So um, I'll start with uh, our, our good-looking man there, Pastor Raul Ortiz. Yes. Um, as you know, he was kind of heading up the operations on Sunday as we were set up tear down church, and that takes a lot of hands. There's a lot of volunteers that do that, and Pastor Raul has valiantly uh, led the charge on that. But we're actually having him focus on the whole education column of our church, from, from little ones all the way to college students. Um, and so he'll become our education pastor, okay? Uh, going to the right, uh, another good looking man. We got uh, Pastor Paul Dario. He's our, um, he was serving as our executive pastor. Um, but we, as you know, we hired uh, Pastor Lawrence, we introduced a few weeks ago. He's now our new executive pastor. And Pastor Paul is sliding over for discipleship. So he'll be focusing on home groups, marriage and family, um, and our life classes. And that's his passion. So uh, Pastor Paul, our new discipleship pastor, uh, sliding to the right. I'm just going to stop mentioning looks. They're all good looking. They're all good looking people. Um, pastor Matt, you haven't met him yet. He'll be joining us in a few weeks, but he'll be taking over Raul's slot with the operations. So all the setup and tear down, that man will be in charge and he'll be one of our newest staff members. Please, please love on him. And when he's fully with us, we'll do a full introduction for Matt and his family. Um, going down, you see Kaylin's beautiful face, Kaylin Carter. She was, there she is. As you know, she was our amazing RK director, Renew Kids director. Um, she still loves children, but we're having her move over to another passion of hers, which is, which is uh, Project 614. And so she'll be working with Julie to push all our initiatives and make them as, as effective as possible. So, so Kaylin Carter is our new Project 614 manager. And to... She's amazing, and to uh, backfill her, we had to hire three people. And so uh, our new RK team, we got Justin Simmons, <laughs> Kara Mosley, and Brittany Brogan, our three-headed monster, along with Pastor Raul, who will be overseeing all of that. They're going to be an amazing team to lead our children. And on the upper left, last but not least, Tina Dario, Paul's... Amazing wife will be helping with women's ministry and uh, discipleship in general. So this is the new, our new Brady Bunch right here, this whole eight faces. Um, we, we, they are here to equip you. They're not doing all the work of ministry. They're here to equip you to do the work of the kingdom. So if we can bow our heads together, let's pray. Oh, we thank you so much, God, for this amazing staff, for all the ways you're realigning them, for the new staff. We pray for favor, the filling of your spirit, that they would lead boldly, courageously, and they would indeed equip your people to do the work you've called us to do. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Can we stand and honor the work that they've done and the work they will do? Thank you, guys. I got a small gift. Can you pass these out? Yeah. On behalf of the church, small token of our appreciation. Love you guys and thank you. And now you guys can head off stage. Yeah, thank you. Have a seat. It's good to be back. I've been away for a minute. It's really good to be back home. And I never take for granted this privilege of, of preaching to uh, my people. Um, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. As you know, um, we are in a series on the book of Mark. We're just marching through it chapter by verse. And uh, today we're covering Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. Um, last week, Pastor Brett, if you were here, our sending pastor, spoke on Jesus' encounter with uh, someone with leprosy. If you missed that, you definitely want to catch that online. Today, we're looking at verse 13 to 17, where Jesus meets tax collector. And so let's read this passage together. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. 
Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Let me pray. Lord, open up this word to our hearts. Would you speak, Jesus? Speak your words to your people and use me in any way possible to accomplish this. And I pray this in your name. Amen. You have to ask why Mark includes this particular story. In fact, as you read the Gospel of Mark, you have to always ask, why do you specifically mention this? It's a short book, action-packed. He could have picked any number of stories. And in the Gospel of John, it says that if John were to have recorded everything Jesus did, there would not be enough room in the world for all the books he'd have to write. So every gospel is a, co a, a very careful, um, selected experience of Jesus, collated very specifically. And uh, you got to ask why this particular story with a tax collector. And I think it's basically this. If, I don't want to over-preach this. I think it's straightforward. That Jesus is a friend of sinners. Because that's what he does here. He befriends people who are considered, quote-unquote, sinners. And that's an amazing thing. I know Jesus later himself says with his own words, I'm a friend. I'm a friend of sinners. Now think about that. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, King of kings. Lord of lords. Being a friend to sinners. You all ever have a friend you don't deserve before? You all have a friend, you're like, why are you my friend? Like, I don't deserve you. Maybe you guys are all amazing studs and <laughs> you were that friend to someone else. Thank you for, for doing that, by the way, for condescending and lowering yourself. But I was the guy who had some friends who I did not deserve. Uh, I remember um, back in fourth grade, my parents moved us from the city to the burbs, and that meant finding a new church. Um, and it was a traumatic experience. You know, not only moving to a new city, new school, but these deep friendships you formed in church, all that had to switch out. I was a city kid going into a, you know, suburban kids are scary. I think city kids are scary. Suburban, city kids deal with chaos and stuff all their life. And so you kind of build some survival skills. But these suburban kids, they bring all their junk to church. That's where, because they can't mess around at school or at home, but they bring it to church. And so I come in and these like, I'm not used to these kinds of kids. And um, I remember being bullied uh, the first few weeks and not wanting to go to church because I was the city kid and they weren't very accepting of me. In fact, I'd be chased. My parents, funny, my parents are here. I don't think they know the story. But I got chased around church, like running for my life. There's one particular chubby kid. Let's call him Charlie. That's his actual name, actually. <laughs> but I don't think he'll watch this. It's fine. And Charlie, if you're there, I, I love you. But um, he, would, he would run after me and throw things at me. And I remember, man, like, I don't want to go to church until this guy Johnny showed up. That's his real name, too. Um, <laughs> this is fourth grade, but he had a leather jacket on, long hair that covered his eyes. It was kind of punk rock, skater time. He come in, And you could tell immediately he was cool. He looked two years older. I think he had stubble. I mean, he was that kind of kid. <laughs> and again, I was being tormented, being made fun of. I was the kid who raised his hand and answered the actual questions the teacher would ask. I was that kind of kid. And they, I get made fun of for that. And again, they're teasing me. And then, and then, and Johnny's always, you know, kind of in the shadow, in the corner, just observing. And the first thing I, I remember him saying was saying, Charlie, shut up. Dion's my guy. I was like, what? I don't even know, 
I don't even know Johnny. I, don't, I never talked to him before. But here's this, this cool guy in the corner in a leather jacket saying that I'm his guy. And then he proceeded to just rip Charlie apart and completely make fun of him, which I delighted in, of course. <laughs> After that, there was an aura of coolness that got imported unto me. And I was, I, I don't know why to this day, I don't know why Johnny became my friend. We were like, maybe because I was a city kid or something, I don't know. But he became my friend. He talked to me. It wasn't just like a one-off on that particular Sunday school day, but he became my friend. And as long as I was with Johnny, I was untouchable. This little, I mean, those kinds of friendships are a little miracle. Little moments of grace. I don't deserve this. I don't know why he plucked me out of that group of kids, but I became his buddy. As long as I was with him, as long as he was my advocate, I was safe. And then eventually I beat Charlie up and we're, we're cool, all right? <laughs> All that was done with. And I became friends with Charlie. So, Charlie, I love you. Uh, anyway, all this to say, all this to say, it's mind-blowing to me that Jesus became a friend to sinners. It's such a cavalier, cliche thing to say, but when you unpack that, Jesus, the Son of God, who all he knew was perfection, and angelic beings and creatures we can't even speak of, they're so glorifying and mysterious, came down into our world and condescended so far to become a genuine friend to people who would not even be friended by normal people. And what's more crazy is that we're expected to do the same because nothing in the book of Mark is written as information or history, but as impartation and revelation, as instruction for his disciples to follow and emulate what Jesus has done. So if Jesus is a friend of sinners, then I have to be a friend of sinners. And that's my burden of the sermon today is to figure out how we do this today in Los Angeles. Would you go there with me? All right. Here's the first thing I see. Notice the way Jesus sees. Notice the way, Je touch your eyes and say, God, change my eyes. Change my eyes. That's the first thing that has to happen. Because Jesus doesn't see like us. We see in verse 13 that as Jesus walks about, a crowd follows him. That tends to happen. There's something about Jesus, something about his light, something about the way he talked. There was an authority that was different from the scribes and the Pharisees. They seemed to teach out of a book. Jesus seemed to teach directly from heaven. And so crowds followed. And like a snowball that you roll in the Midwest when there was snow, you push a snowball, it collects snow. As it gets bigger, it collects more. Jesus is just collecting people as he moves, as, as he teaches. And then people are seeing a crowd. And what do you do when you see a crowd? You join the crowd. And so you imagine this. As Jesus is teaching, there's this interchanging inner circle of maybe 80 to 100 people around him, people jostling to, to get closer to Jesus. Behind him, there are perhaps thousands, and they're moving through the village trying to hear this man teach. Now, I don't know if you've ever interacted with a large crowd. Well, let's make it more practical. Maybe you've been to a party, to a house filled with people. And the first thing you do when you're interacting with a lot of people is you start to sort, right? You try to pick out faces. Maybe you're looking for cute faces. It's been a while for me. I've been married 17 years, but maybe you're looking for someone that's attractive. Maybe you're looking for someone who looks like they're at your level, certainly not below your level. You're looking for people who dress a certain way, who speak a certain way. They've got a crowd of people around them that you, you want to be a part of. I don't know how you sort, but we sort, there's people you see, and then there's people you don't see. There's people you look away from. There's people you won't go near. There's people that you just never see. They're just backdrop. And what's so interesting to me here in this passage is that as Jesus is moving through villages, as he's surrounded by throngs of people, there's people jostling to be with him. I would think if you're the savior of the world, if you're the son of God, and you know you've got three short years to do the work you have to do to change everyone's life, I'm looking for specific robes of power. I'm looking for advocates who can take me into government. 
I'm looking for people that can widen my platform as quickly as possible because I got three years to change the world. And yet, the one that Jesus locks eyes on and stops to notice is someone that no one wants to see. No one wants to see. It says a tax collector at a tax collector's booth, at a toll booth. When's the last time you've locked eyes with a toll booth operator? When's the last time you made conversation with it? other than I've got a five, can you give me change? Maybe that. But have you ever locked eyes on a toll booth operator? Like if you're talking about people who are just background, that's like literally just background. But let's push it farther and, and get closer to this context. Imagine the toll booth operator is evil. Maybe like today at the level of a drug dealer, someone you know who's ruining lives and you find despicable. A tax collector was so bad in the Jewish mind, they were clustered with words like prostitute, outcast, sinner, untouchable. Because tax collectors were sympathizers of Rome. They collaborated with their oppressors to collect money on Rome's behalf. And the way tax collectors became rich, and they were all filthy rich, is they would gouge their people. The Romans would set a certain tax amount, and they would go farther because whatever they got on top of the amount that Rome wanted, they kept. And so the richer the tax collector, the more they gouged their people. And so people hated tax collectors. Not only because you got to give money. No one loves your IRS agent. right? No one loves your tax agent. On top of that, they were doing it for Rome. And they were cheating their people, charging more than Rome wanted. And so if you're going to look at this guy, it's only to hate. Most likely, you try to stay away, as far away as possible from this guy. And so when Jesus stops to look at Levi, they're thinking, okay, maybe it's going to be a massive rebuke. Maybe this is the time he'll go on a tirade about Rome and talk about the way he's going to pull Rome apart and, and rebuke these sympathizers. They had no idea. They were stunned to hear Jesus say, as he locks eyes on Levi, follow me. And this Levi becomes Matthew, one of the disciples. Levi is his Hebrew name. Matthew is his Greek name. Jesus picks his disciple from the most unlikely place. And we see in verse 15 that Jesus becomes Matthew's friend. He eats with him along with Matthew's buddies. How do I become a friend of sinners like Jesus? Well, you can't befriend who you don't see. Jesus had a habit of seeing people no one wanted to see. Whether it be a woman possessed by seven demons, whether it be a man possessed by thousands of demons who would rip his clothes off and break chains that were meant to bind him and protect him and protect the people he would harass, whether it be a Samaritan woman that even the other Samaritans considered a harlot and would not go near. Jesus had a way of seeing these people and not just seeing them, but befriending them and turning them into his most devoted followers and evangelists. Let me ask you a weird question. Who do you not see? Who escapes your attention? Who causes you to look away? Who are the people you try not to see? Who are the people you typically avoid? Who are the people that are typically just background to you? Because most likely... The most life-changing, kingdom-oriented friendships will come from there. Because therein is the greatest potential for testimony. Bringing anyone to Jesus is amazing news. If it's your friend that you know, if it's someone in your close inner circle, praise God. But when you bring someone in that you have no business knowing, there now is a miracle that the world can't ignore. Who are the outcasts within your personal network of people? Who have you conditioned yourself not to see? Jesus saw differently. How? A few clues. When Jesus teaches his people how to pray, he says, Pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And then later he says that he does nothing by himself, but only what he sees his father doing. Whatever his father does, the son also does. In other words, Jesus lived a life of constant prayer where he's constantly asking God, what should I do? What should I do? And most likely, who should I see? Every night, every morning, it says he prayed in loud groans. And then most likely, because he's filled with the Spirit, he's constantly talking to God throughout the day. God, what do you want? What does heaven want? What am I supposed to do? And who am I supposed to see? And with those kinds of eyes, he categorizes people only into two categories. And you see that in verse uh, 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. There's just two categories. Doesn't matter how well dressed they are, doesn't matter what station of life they're in, what political power they hold, how attractive, how unattractive. Jesus saw only two things people who know their need for him and people who don't. That's it. Either you think you're healthy, which is a lie, no one's healthy, or you know you're sick. Either you know. You need Jesus. Either you know you need a Savior or you're in denial. That's all he sees. Which is why he tends to spend most of his time with people we wouldn't. Because they're the ones who are most aware of their need for a Savior. The broken, the outcasts. They have no illusions about the world. They know they're messed up. And so therefore, in that economy where it's just two categories, those who know their need for Jesus and those who don't, they're the ones who got it right. They're the ones who are closest which flips the whole thing upside down, doesn't it? So here's what this means for us. If we want to start to have eyes like Jesus, we got to sort differently. we got to see differently. And the way I think that happens is we pray with the way Jesus prays, Lord, give me your eyes. Help me to, help me to see people the way you see them. Not in the, the categories of the world, but simply who needs Jesus. Who is aware of their need for Jesus? And Holy Spirit, draw my attention to that person. Make me sensitized. to Because pe- I think as Jesus walked around, certain people lit up. And the Spirit said, talk to that person. Reveal this to that person. Because Jesus is always talking to the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. And so as he's praying constantly, Lord, open my eyes. The Spirit's drawing Jesus to a certain person that no one else would go near. And he, and he parks and he ministers. He saves He heals. It's not as if Jesus is just randomly like, oh, I guess I'll stop here. Hello, leper. It specifically says, Jesus says, I only do what the Father tells me. Which means every miracle, every healing, every encounter came with instruction from the Holy Spirit. So how do I start seeing like Jesus? i got to open up a channel of communication every morning. Lord, help me see. Help me see people I normally wouldn't see. This happened to me one time in Korea. I was uh, traveling there sometime uh, in my early 20s. And um, I was wanting to catch a train to a specific city in Korea. And I get there. It was just me and this American military guy in uniform, you know, on the platform but further down. And I was kind of lost. Uh, I hadn't been to Korea much at all. So, so I walked over. I asked the soldier, um, do you know how to get to this city? He's like, oh, yeah, it's the next train, so just you know, get on when I get on. So great, we get on. He sits in the front. I sit in the back, and there's probably 15 rows between us, empty. And the Holy Spirit says, go talk to him. I said, you're crazy. No. Train's empty. He's a soldier. I, I don't know anything about that. And this is, you know, we're just traveling. But the Spirit was very clear. I'm supposed to talk to this person. There's something about this person I have to to sit next to and talk to him. And so I awkwardly crept up to this man. (laughs) Fifteen empty rows. I sat next to him. And he looks at me like, are you, what's wrong with you? And I told him, just real awkwardly, God told me to sit next to you. I had no game. I had no way of doing this war. How do I... It's just, <laughs> his reaction was, oh, he was stunned into silence. And I said, you know, I know of a good restaurant. I was lying. I don't know any restaurants. Uh, next city, why don't we grab some noodles? He's like, okay. 
So I, I could read enough Korean to see noodles. And we, we go there. We start talking. I'm, I'm surprised he's even with me. But I find out within 10 minutes that he had committed a crime on the base. And he was thinking of going AWOL. And he was asking God for a sign. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the sign. <laughs> God loves you. Go back. Get right with God. Be honest. Your life will change if you do. We lost touch since. But it was a reminder. And honestly, this doesn't happen to me all the time. But it's a reminder that if I actually listen to the Holy Spirit, he will draw my attention to people I would normally ignore and not see. Who do you not see? How many people do you pass through as just background, as just props to your own drama of life? How many coworkers do you not see? How many people in your neighborhood have you stopped seeing? Maybe if we woke up asking, thy will be done, not mine. Lord, I don't want to do anything that you don't want me to do. Lead me. Open my eyes. Let me see. Perhaps a spotlight will fall on somebody that you never expected. And he'll give you words to say you never thought you'd say. And something miraculous might happen. The only way we become friends to sinners is we can see people. The second thing is that we should notice the way Jesus eats. He eats differently. Because it's not just that he saw Matthew. And not only did he say, follow me. The first command he gives Matthew, presumably, is that Jesus would follow Matthew back into his house. He did that with Zacchaeus too. Come down from the tree. I want to go eat at your house. So most likely that's what happened with Matthew is, follow me. And here's the first thing I want to do is follow you back to your house. And we're going to eat. So it's not Matthew at a distance. It's not Matthew, here are my disciples, but you're a tax collector, so you're in purgatory for a year, probation, and when you get right, then you can come into the inner circle. Jesus immediately wants to eat. And if the crowd was confused by Jesus' command to follow, they didn't speak it out loud at that moment. But when you hear criticism is when Jesus actually enters the house and began to eat. Back then, large homes, and presumably Matthew had a large home, he was rich. They had a courtyard that would open where you could look in from the street to see what people are doing. And people are looking in, and they see villains, despicable people that, that Mark lumps in as sinners, outcasts, people who can't go to temple. People are so habitually sinful that they can't enter into the presence of God, tax collectors and other such folk. And Jesus is eating with them, which in those times and still today is an act of intimacy and fellowship because you're sharing plates, you're sharing food, you're touching bread together. And so Jesus is, is eating, and they ask, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? It's scandalous. But here's the thing. These religious folk didn't know half the story because if they could see Jesus' heart, they would have been so scandalized because it's not just that Jesus wants to eat with them. He loves them. He loves sinners. That sharing of the meal was just a small expression of his huge heart for lost people. The glimpse you get here in this chapter is fully explained in Luke 15, where much like this context, uh, the religious uh, the, uh, the people who prided themselves in being religious were grumbling. Jesus, why do you keep hanging out with sinners? And Jesus says, let me tell you three stories. And he tells these three consecutive stories in Luke 15. The first is where a man uh, has a hundred sheep that he loves. One wanders off. He leaves the 99 to find the one. When he finds the sheep, he throws a massive party with all his neighbors to celebrate the fact that this lost sheep has been found. And he says, heaven's doing that too when lost people come home. The second story on the heels is a woman whose whole life savings amounts to 10 coins. She loses one, so she flips the whole house upside down to find that one coin. And when she does, she rejoices, throws a party. And again, that's what heaven does when a lost person comes home. And then the final story, which most of you know, is when a son, a son leaves the father and loses himself 
in a life of sin, but he comes home. And the father runs to the son and showers the son with kisses and, and throws, again, a massive party. You can see the, the value of the story goes up from sheep to gold coins to a son. And you can see the intensity of emotions go up from, from rejoicing to now covering with kisses. And, and Jesus' whole point is, do you not know my heart for these people you consider outcasts? I love them. My father loves them. I'm willing to leave the 99 to find the one. I'm willing to flip the world upside down. And that's what he did. He incarnated into this world to chase us down, all of us who are sinners. And he's like, you got this backwards. I don't just tolerate sinners. I love them. I love them. And I find that really, really convicting that Jesus loves lost people because, frankly, I often don't care. Is it okay for your pastor to be honest? I mean, I care enough that if you come to my church, we'll get you cleaned up and put you through a system and, you know, get you integrated into home groups. But that's if you come to my church. I'm surrounded by lost people. And it's become backdrop. It's become, the city has become a backdrop to the life I live. Like, how, am I po how is it possible for me to love lost people? How, how do I do that, God? How, how do I possibly love lost people when I struggle to love uh, my family and love my leaders and love this church? Not that I'm saying anything bad about you all, just I'm a selfish person. How do I have the heart of Jesus? I can't do it, Jesus. I can't. How do I possibly... And I think Jesus is just asking me a simple question. Dion, who sits around your table? Don't worry about the city. Just who sits at your table? Whose table do you sit at? Just one by one, individual by individual, do you care at all about the people I bring into your life, about the people you encounter? Here's a question. Who sits at your table? Now, if you're the kind of person, you have lost people at your table all the time, Praise God. Keep doing it. Help us know how we can equip you and encourage you to do that because you're salt and light. But if you're like me and the people around your table all make sense, all make common sense, and they're familiar and they're sanctified, I don't have anyone coming to my table who needs Jesus. I've gone off track. If I'm not entering into tables with people who need Jesus... I have gotten off track because I'm supposed to follow Jesus. And Jesus enters Matthew's house full of sinners. And so I'm asking God, God, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I'm so busy. I've got a family. I've got three girls. One of them's a teenager. Help me, Jesus. I've got growing church. I've got a staff. I've got problems. I, my own believing folk have drama in their life. I have to be there for them. How can I possibly love sinners? And God, as he moved us to Mar Vista, we moved recently, put us with a neighbor, 75 years old, who doesn't know Jesus, who comes to our house every day. We're, I don't think she'll watch this, <laughs> but we're, we're, I think we're her only friends. She had to go to the hospital. No family to call. She's recently moved into, so it's not like she knows anybody. She comes to us. She comes to our house and says, I need a ride to the hospital. She's sick. She asks us for food. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I, I want friends who are my age. <laughs> I, I want to hang out with somebody I can shoot pool with or, like, talk to about my but here's a 75-year-old woman who, who needs Jesus, who is literally making it easy for us by coming over every day. And I still don't want to do it. I still don't want to make a place at my table. I think if you open your heart to lost people, and you open your heart to the city, it will not be 12 million people. It will be one, maybe two. Someone who lives near you, a coworker who's trying to get your attention, but they're just 
You don't want to deal with it. You don't see them. They're not advantageous to you. They're not going to show up on your Instagram, and they're not going to widen your platform. But there's a spotlight. Who sits at your table? Does it always make sense? Because if it always makes sense, we're not disciples of Jesus. Jesus confounded people because his table did not make sense. And that's to my neighbor. That's to my neighbor who lives next to me. What about people who are not my neighbors, who I feel like I have zero connection with? What about them? And I was thinking to myself how there's this, um, this place I drive by every single day. And um, I have, um, every time I drive through it, my heart breaks. Uh, and so recently, as we were meeting with Serve West LA, which is one of our initiatives, Project 614, we're thinking of how to serve the city. We're brainstorming. Uh, our goal is remove 10, or address 10% of homelessness in Culver City. What does that mean? And, and something lit up in my brain. I said, what about, and you can show this slide, what about this underpass? This is the Venice Boulevard 405 underpass. I drove through it today. I count 30 tents on both sides of the street. Um, I literally drive through this underpass multiple times a day. And I think to my, and what's interesting is on one side is Culver City, on the other side is Los Angeles. It's on the very border. Um, and I think to myself, when will LA get their act together? When will Culver City get their act together? When will these people get their act together? This is an eyesore. This is a uh, sanitation issue. This is a you know, safety issue. Who's going to address this? And surprisingly, and to a little bit of my horror, I hear God say, you're going to address this. God, what are you going to do about this? He said, Dion, I put a church called Renew two miles away from this underpass. I even taught a parable about someone passing by, people in need, and not stopping. And Dion, you even preached the whole two-month series on gospel hospitality, but loving people that are within your eyesight. Culver City doesn't want to touch this. Los Angeles doesn't want to touch this. And this underpass, this specific underpass, has become the iconic problem for homelessness on the west side. They throw this shot up, I mean, this is a Google uh, map shot, but there's other photos when they talk about homelessness on the west side. It's this underpass. And so I brought this up with my team, Chris Coe, who's a director at United Way, one of the leading voices on homelessness, was there. And so I fly everything by him, because unless he thinks it's doable, it's not doable. And I go, Chris, what about this underpass? And he says to me, Dehan, that is so hot. <laughs> like I was talking about a really attractive young lady. Like, that's so hot. I'm like, excuse me? He goes, that's so hot. That's amazing. No one wants to touch this. No one wants to touch this. There's so many issues wrapped up in this, into this political, social. There's so many things happening. And if we could bring healing to this, we would, we would impact this city, two cities, in a major, major way. And so as I'm preaching this, I've got my neighbor who needs love, but as a church, who are we passing by as a community that we don't see, or if we see, it's like, I don't want to see this. I feel the Spirit telling us that this is now our parish, that these 30 tents should not remain 30 tents a couple years from now, that whatever we have to do to love this community and bring healing and restoration and, if possible, homes this is our parish. This is our community. And so I'm aiming Serve West LA to that. Not just an amorphous 10%, but literally, how do we become neighbors? How do we prayer walk? How do we serve? How do we partner with Mar Vista, Los Angeles, all the nonprofits already on the ground? How do we mobilize 600 people to love this underpass and make a difference? Let me ask you a question. As you get older, 
as you become more mature, is your network shrinking more and more to people that make sense, that add value to your life? That, yeah, to some degree that's helpful. You need to know who your champions are. But Jesus always made room. He always made room for people that don't make sense. He always allowed the Holy Spirit to lead him to, to, to encounters and to communities that don't make any sense. And so I'm asking you, would you be willing to see and be willing to eat with people you normally would not because you want to follow Jesus, because you want to emulate him, and most most of all, because he did that for you. This came to me as I was writing this sermon. Would I ever walk into one of those tents? If like a flap opened up and someone's like, I got crackers and cheese. Come on in. I don't want to step into like meth and filth and whatever. I mean, these are stereotypes. I'm sure that stuff is there, but I don't want to step into that tent because it's dirty and I could get hurt and it's way beneath me, all those reasons. Jesus stepping into the house of a tax collector is far more than that because this is the Son of God who came into a sinner's house. But even more so, Jesus entering my life. My heart is far dirtier than a tent full of meth. Whatever physical condition that tent is in is nothing compared to the spiritual condition of my heart when Jesus befriended me. And if I'm not aware of that, if I don't realize what Jesus did, how much he loved me to enter my world, to give up his life for me, and now to make his home in me, in the state of my life, God, who only knew glory, makes his home in me, it's nothing. This is nothing. How dare I think that this community or my neighbor or anyone I pass by is beyond the grace of God? Jesus is a friend of sinners. God, change my eyes. Let me see and change the way I eat. May my life stretch wide enough to include and love those you want me to love. Bow your heads. Our worship team, you can come on up.